can participate. Oh, comes from practicing Good morning and happy Father's Day. Dads play a unique and important role in the formation of our families. We want to celebrate all of our dads out there. Thank you for showing up and being around today. Some of you are attending for the first time today. Thank you for taking the time to visit. We want to get to know you. Would you please scan the QR code on the back of the seat near you, then tap the Say Hello link. <laughs> our transformation comes from practicing Jesus' words in our lives. Here are a few upcoming events in which you can participate. <laughs> Currently, we are raising money to expand the church's facility, making room for more people to encounter the life-giving message of Jesus. Your faithful generosity is helping us reach the goal while still having a vibrant ministry. You can give today in the giving boxes on the wall, or you can give securely online. Scan the QR code on the seat near you. Knowing scripture is essential to knowing God. We are reading through the entire Bible this year. God has given us His own story in written form inspired by His own Spirit to teach us about Himself so that we can come in fuller communion with Him. We have a special place on the Central Hub where you find information about the Bible reading plan we called the Bible Recap. Scan the QR code on the back of the chairs to quick link to that. If you haven't started reading the Bible yet, you can do that today. We read together to remind us of where we are going. That is towards Jesus. Allowing the scriptures, the Holy Spirit, and the family of God to form a fidelity of allegiance to Him alone. Please stand as we read aloud and confess this together. We believe God is a creator of all and the sustainer of all. We admit our attempts to make life flourish on our own are vain and futile. Loving Father, You are the true gardener who cultivates life. So cut away from our lives all that is choking out your abundant life. We want to say no to the things that seem good, so we can say yes to the best you have intended for us. We confess that our greed for more in this life doesn't produce a healthy soul. Jesus, we desire to abide in you, the true vine and be filled with all of your wisdom and abundance. Holy Spirit, transform us into radiant people who flourish. We desire to live like Jesus and less like the world around us. We choose to practice joy, hope, generosity, love, and unity. These are essential. Good morning, Faith Church. Let's put our hands together and praise the Lord this morning. Praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. I praise when I'm sure and praise when I'm down. I praise when I'm numbered, praise when surrounded. His praise is the water, my enemies drowned in. Oh 
I praise cause you're sovereign, praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody greater than you. I praise cause you're sovereign, praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true.
ti por seguir Hallelujah All the hopeless come to Jesus Let the dead come back to life Can you hear the people singing Hallelujah Come on church All the hopeless come to Jesus Let the dead come back
speak hallelujahs to his name praise to his name god you're worthy of it all jesus we thank you that you are the king of all heavenly father we are grateful you are our father in heaven lord there is none we desire beside you god you're worthy you're worthy you're worthy you're worthy holy are you lord holy are you lord majestic is your name in all the earth May the heavens declare the glory and the goodness of God. May we who have 
breath be those that praise the Lord. Lord, from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same, your name is to be praised. Your name is to be hallowed and honored. You are our Father in heaven. Holy is your name. Holy is your name. Lord, we want to join with the chorus of heaven, singing praise to the Lord. Praise to the one. Praise to the one. Praise to you. Glory and honor, blessing and power are yours, God. May a thousand hallelujahs flow from our lips and from our lives. Oh, Lord, we declare your goodness. You are praiseworthy, God. You are praiseworthy, God. Hallelujah. You know, all through Scripture, the Bible talks about people ascending to a mountain to encounter the living God. They, they, they climb the mountains, they go up to the, to the tops, and that's where God, God is said to dwell. That's where His presence is. That's where His power is. That's, so they would always go up. It requires you to leave kind of the normal space to traverse to where God would dwell and be. To, to leave kind of normal and go beyond it so that you can encounter God where, where He is. He, he's, there's, there's a place often that we can go where we just get to meet with God. This week we have uh, over 15 youth, several adults, kind of leaving the normal rhythms of our weeks to go and encounter the living God this week at summer camp. We as a church are helping to send them along the way. And today we want to cover them in prayer and send them out with prayer. Uh, in fact, this week, I, I, I want to ask, uh, would you be willing every day, Monday through Friday this week, to pray for the students, the youth, and the things that are happening at camp. How many of you would be willing to say, I'll do that every day this week? Thank you. Amen. We're going to do that. What we want to do today or in this moment is to pray specifically for them and for that purpose too. So if you're in the room and you are a student going to camp, if you are a parent sending a student to camp, or if you're one of the leaders going to camp, would you right where you're at, would you just put your hand up high, right where you're at, hand up high, you're going to camp, there you go. If you are nearby somebody with their hand up, would you go near them and place a hand on their shoulder uh, so that we can pray together? I'm going to invite Jarrett to come up. He's going to kind of lead us in a time of prayer. And if you're not near somebody who's got their hand up and you're not really wanting to move, just stretch your hands towards Jarrett because he's leading uh, our, our crew and he needs lots of prayer this week as well. I want you to take the, f the next 20 seconds and whatever's on your mind or heart, would you pray that over our youth and our students and all those who would be at camp? You take the first 20 seconds, you pray on your own right there where you're at, mumble out loud a whisper prayer to the Lord, and then Jared's going to lead us. Ready? Let's begin to pray, church. Father, as we lift up our youth this morning, I just thank you for that. We have a, a body here of believers, Lord, that supports our youth, that wants to see them succeed and know you, Lord, that wants to see them followers of Jesus and going out into the world, Lord, the next generation coming up, Lord, to see them strive in who they are, that God says who they are, Lord. And I pray that this week as we head over to El Dorado, El Dorado Springs, Lord, that you would give us safe travels to and from, Lord, that you would be with the staff there that's been prepping this week lord for so long that you would be with them as they get ready and all the the meals and services and the the nights that pastor is speaking lord that you would just speak through him and the spirit would be flowing lord that you would um watch over us as we're on the campgrounds lord and um spending time in fellowship lord i pray uh, for the parents of the the teens going lord that you just give them a peace uh throughout this week lord a, a just 
um, overwhelming, um, embodying them with just comfort as their kids are away for, for a little bit, Lord, but knowing that great things are happening at camp, Lord. And uh, we lift up the teens in this room, Lord, that are, that are going to camp, that whatever um, giants or, or Goliaths that stand in their way, Lord, that that would be laid down at the cross as we meet you, Lord that there'd be a time where we just can reflect and and be in your presence on the campground, Lord, that there'd be uh, friendships made, new friendships made as as fellow believers throughout this week, and we just pray for safety and guidance um, as we um, lean into you and hear your voice. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, y'all can take a minute and go ahead and greet one another. Welcome to Faith Church. Glad you are here. If we haven't met, uh, my name is Matthew, one of the pastors, and it's a delight to have you with us. And a big happy Father's Day. All you dads out there, I hope you got here early enough to get some of the delicious goodness that was being grilled up out there. And uh, on the way out today, for every dude present, every guy present, we've got a little uh, delicious little packet of uh, goodness to remind you uh, of uh, to live your flavor in God out in the world. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to try some of these. This is going to be fun. Uh, so make sure you pick some of those on your way out. I want to uh, bring a message today out of Psalms 127, uh, and the title of the message today is No Shame in Your Game. Somebody say, No Shame in Your Game. Talk a little bit today from Psalms 127. In fact, if you are there in the scriptures, would you stand up? If you're following along digitally, would you stand up? And if you're like, I'm just going to read it on the big TVs, would you stand up? So if you're able, please stand as we read God's word together. I'll read out loud. You follow along right where you're at. Psalms 127 says this. Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with sentries will do no good. It's useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat. For God gives rest to his loved ones. Children are a gift from the Lord. There it is. They are a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city gates. This is the word of the Lord, and we are grateful. Everybody said amen. Amen. Hey, you can be seated today. Now, we've been studying the book of Psalms, and we're going to continue to do it this summer. And I know a lot of you, uh, you were like, oh, Psalms 1, we're starting at the very beginning. And then last week, we skipped to Psalms 23, and you're like, whoa, 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 pal, we skipped a bunch of Psalms. And then today, all of you like really like OCD people are like, wait, now we're at 127, there's only 150, where are we going next? We'll go backwards next week, and it's just all going to be a bit chaotic, and that's going to be okay for all of us just to take a deep breath and enjoy the process of studying the scriptures. Psalms 127 is an interesting one. Psalms 127 is a part of uh, about 14 psalms that are known as the Psalms of the Ascent. These are psalms that the children of Israel would sing 
as they travel and pilgrimage towards Jerusalem and into the temple itself. Now, Jerusalem is seated, is seated high up in Israel. In fact, everywhere you would go in Israel, you have to go up if you're going to go to Jerusalem. Jer Jerusalem and the temple is the place where God's presence was, was dwelling for most of the time. What they believed was there. So they would travel up, and as they would travel up, they, they would sing these songs to help shape their perspective in, in the right way. In fact, um, Psalms of Ascent were created to, to create proper focus on God as people progressed on their pilgrimage to the temple. I want to show you some pictures of these ancient temple steps in Israel. I, I took these pictures several years ago, over almost 11, 12 years ago now. I want to show you these, these three pictures to kind of get an idea of, of these steps. Here's, here's the first picture of some of the ancient steps. And as they would take these steps up into the temple, they would actually continue to recite some of these. these some, let me show you the next picture. kind of gives you a little bit more broad spec uh, perspective here on it. And, and again, they're climbing up to this massive, massive temple. This that blessing of this perspective to just, it would come into full view and it would just be so, so wide. I'll show you this last picture here. Um, and in fact, when we were on our, our tour in Israel, our discipleship tour, we would walk these steps that were available to us and we would actually, we spent some time just reciting and saying and reading aloud some of the Psalms of Ascent. In fact, Psalms 127 would have been among them. How, how altering your perspective would have been as you traveled up these, song, uh, up these steps and singing songs like, unless the Lord builds his house, it's all labor in vain. How, how long of a journey and as the day goes on and you just get tired. I don't know about you, but like, I can't walk up as many steps as I used to walk up without being as winded as sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Like you just take some like, <sighs> you just need a little more breathing in, in moments. Can you imagine this long pilgrimage, this long road trip with all the kids and all the things that you're taking annually to go and worship the Lord and you're just trying to get to the place where, where you can worship God and you're like, no, we're not there yet. No, you can't go to the bathroom. Quit spanking the donkey. Would you just get to, like, can you just imagine the wear and the tear of this road trip as they traveled up and they find themselves saying things like, for God gives his loved ones rest, and children are a gift from the Lord. Children are a gift from the Lord. Don't kill the children. Children are a gift from the Lord. As we travel together to Jerusalem, this is a long road trip. Children are a gift from the Lord. Like, as you go up this month, I just got a text message in between services from my sister, my youngest sister, and her and her family are on their way uh, to, to spend some time in Orlando, Florida area, and they have three young girls, uh, and, and young girls, when they get excited, have a certain pitch. You know what I'm talking about? Well, she sent us a video saying, well, this is how my husband's spending his Father's Day, and the girls are screaming at the top. They're like, let go, let go, like just... For about five minutes, it feels like these girls are just excited and yelling. And I'm just like, oh, God bless my brother-in-law. <laughs> just traveling. Psalms of the Ascent, these psalms like Psalms 127 are designed to help shift our perspective from what we see and experience and find now to a proper understanding of God. I wonder if this is kind of what the proper perspective of God is kind of what Paul is getting at in, in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 says this. It says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any, any moral excellence, if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. In other words, let your perspective be shaped by what is true, lovely, just, pure. In other words, it's possible to have your thoughts dwell on things that are not lovely, that are not true, that are not pure, that are not admirable, that are not praiseworthy. Your perspective is yours to manage. My perspective is mine to manage. And Paul is coming along saying, man, I, I want you to have a perspective of what is right and true and good. And then he goes on to say, do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me and 
the God of peace will be with you. It's not just dwelling and thinking about the right things. It's living and doing the right things that bring about the peace that you need in your life. Many of us are living lives right now full of stress, full of anxiety, and full of worry. And it's often because our thoughts are not dwelling in the right direction and our actions are not embodying the way of truth in which would produce about peace in us. I find it interesting today as we celebrate Father's Day that we would be reading about a, a, a psalm that would be shaping our perspective towards God in an accurate way. God our Father. I don't know what your relationship with your dad was like. I don't know... Um, if you find yourself really grateful today, maybe you find yourself just sorrowful that your dad's not present with you today. Maybe you find yourself wanting to run away from this idea altogether because your dad wasn't good to you and you don't have a good relationship with your kids or maybe you don't have any kids and you're like, I just don't know about all of this. Can I just help us understand that sometimes our experiences do shape our perspective? But that perspective doesn't have to be permanent. That God your Father wants to help you grow into a perspective of Him and with Him that allows you to have the right perspective as you dwell and pursue and journey life with, with Him. I'm so thankful for my dad. I, I, uh, I said it in the first service and, and I'll say it again. I'm, I, there's so much that I could give praise and thanks to my dad for. So, so honored by him and his voice and the way he taught us to love God's word and to hear God's voice and to move in that direction. It, he would by, he'd be the first to tell you he wasn't perfect in all those ways. But dad, I just want to say I love you and I'm so thankful for you. I know you were watching in the first service and you probably want to hear this again. So you're watching this service too. And I hope you say, send this to all of my siblings who don't get microphones every week. And they can send you a Hallmark card, but I get to send it out to the YouTube world and everyone knows that I'm your favorite I mean that I love you I love you the, the most I'm thankful for that as we sit on a day like Father's Day I think it's right that we would put in our mind things that are praiseworthy this is why we do things like photo booths and give gifts and I think men need to be celebrated not just tolerated there's something of celebration that needs to arise in our hearts today to celebrate the fathers and the father figures in our life because there is something worthy of praise. I think men need to be anchored to some truths, not just anxious in all things. And I want to encourage and breathe life into us today in, in, in this way. And I, what I love is that uh, I think for, for, for dads especially, but parents in general, this last part of Philippians is kind of a hard one, isn't it? It's not just that we don't want to think about the right things, but then he goes on to say, like, whatever you have learned and heard and seen and received, these things do. In other words, this life of faith is more modeled than commanded. This idea of, of ascending and moving in a direction towards God is one that is more caught than taught. It, the, the, the phrase, um, do as I say, not as I do, hogwash. It doesn't work that way. Your kids and the people around you are watching how we act and live and what we model. And most of what he was saying, it's, it's not just taught, but it's something that we receive. It's not just heard, it's also seen. It's not just commanded, it's something that is modeled. And when we model and live the way of the kingdom of God, there is a peace that comes into our lives and into our homes that I think we are all after. And I think when we think about this idea of like, our kids modeling what we do and our life being more something that we live out rather than something that we just like say to do and then we go live in our own way. I think when, I, when we, if we're getting really, really honest, there's, there's a little bit of like, ouch, I don't know about that. Can I get a redo on some things? Can we rewind that and try again? Can, can, can like 
I get like the, the part where like the, the men in black thing where they like forget certain memories. Can I get that back? Be- because if I'm honest and I, and, I, and I take a deep look in my own heart, when it comes to being a model of a life of faithfulness to God and not one full of anxiousness and worry and stress and uncertainty and failure, I find myself often sitting in a place where shame kind of can creep in. And regret shows up. And a sense of like, I don't know that I can do this. Can feel very overwhelming and crushing for any one man and any one parent. For any one of us, I think shame can easily show up. And it keeps us from courageously modeling a life of faith. And we're not sure what to do, how to do it. And so we just don't do it. Maybe, And I think it's okay to try to figure it out as we go. The important thing is that we just don't do it on our own. And this is where the family of God shows up and helps eliminate the shame in our lives because we sit back and we say, no, no, I'm not going to get it right, but we can do this together. We can figure this thing out. We can learn what it looks like to model a life of faith together. And this is the call that God is calling us to. There's a book I've been reading. It's called Fighting Shadows. It's written by by two authors, and it's fantastic. And if you're a dude in the room, I encourage you to pick up a copy of this and read it. Some of you are like, well, I'm not much of a reader. You might be a podcaster. And in fact, you you love listening to long podcasts like Joe Rogan. You can handle a book on, on audio. And I encourage you to get a hold of it in whatever form you need to begin reading through some of these things. Because when shame shows up, it's one of the shadows that we have to fight in our world and especially fight as men. I want you to hear this excerpt for just a minute from the book. It says this, when shame seeps into the cracks in our heart, you begin to live as a man uh, will likely be tempted by a couple of false solutions to the shame. The first temptation is religion. You'll be tempted to try to clean yourself up by treating your shame like a debt you can repay via religious means. You sacrifice, make penance, go to church that Sunday, you give to the poor, you get the idea. These are all good things, by the way, but they do nothing for your shame. Trying to heal your own shame with religion is like trying to fight a forest fire with a kid's water squirt gun. You won't put out a single flame. The second temptation is distraction. Where the temptation of religion is to think you can self-clean your shame, distraction invites you to numb your feelings of shame. Let's be honest with ourselves. Shame can get very loud. It feels like real pain. And what do we do with pain? We medicate. When it comes to shame, we are so easily tempted to try to make it go away by feeling something stronger. That something else could be sex, whether illicit sex or sex with our spouse. It could be money, whether gambling or wise business investments. It could be food, whether an unhealthy addiction to food or just food in general. Whether the distraction is fundamentally bad or something that is just fine. If we are using it to drown and medicate the shame, it's going to cause harm. Even in your efforts to lead to a temporary relief, they're not going to solve your problem of shame. You can't fix your shame by religion or bury it with distraction. There's only one real solution. It's an invitation. An invitation from God himself. He invites us not to be religiously modify our shame or to medicate our shame. He offers to heal our shame. And for that to happen, we need to drag our shame into God's presence where he can speak not just about us, but to us. Telling us the truth about who we are and how he sees us. When I think about life today, and I think about this psalm of ascent, this psalm of ascent is trying to help us shift our perspective away from shame that has created such stress and anxiety in our lives. 
and trying to offer a better perspective and alternative to the numbing pain and the religious exercise we often try and pursue regardless of our gender and age. Shame gives birth to stress and anxiety in us. I've talked about this so many times lately, but I keep talking about it because, um, because God has been bringing such deep revelation in his word to me and to my heart around this idea, not just of shame, but where shame comes from. Shame is not just a feeling that we feel when we do something wrong. In fact, shame is different. Guilt is good. Guilt is something you feel when you recognize what you did was wrong. We need that. We need that kind of, oh, that wasn't right. I shouldn't have done that. We need that feeling. Shame tries to tell you that you can't do anything about what you did as wrong and that, that your identity is wrong. Shame tries to speak to who you are, not what you did. And shame doesn't come from God. In fact, Jesus came to take all of our sin and shame on the cross. Shame is a result of the whisper of the spirit of fear. Shame is not a feeling. Please, please hear me. Shame is an evil force animating itself in your life. The Bible doesn't give many names to evil spirits, to, to, to demonic. It doesn't give many names. But one that it gives is this, the spirit of fear. And I've said from the beginning, what is the spirit of fear? The spirit of fear is a whisper into your imagination and your heart, creating a, a picture of your future that is void of God's power, void of God's love, and void of God's presence in your life. How does it look in our lives? Well, shame wants to whisper as the spirit of fear in your life that God's power isn't real, so you're always helpless to live this life that you're living. He wants to tell you that God's love isn't for you, so you're rejected, so don't even try. And his presence isn't real, so you'll always be on your own. And most often, shame wants to whisper to you this idea as it relates to God's love being absent in your life. So he convinces you, you will be rejected if you try. You're going to be rejected if you get honest about what you're struggling with. You're going to get rejected if you're not successful in your life. You're going to be rejected by your dad if you don't get good grades in school. You're going to get rejected if. And all it does is it opens up the door when the spirit of fear is in our lives. Listen, listen, that evil force shows up. And one of the things that it does is it increases your anxiety. This passage in Psalms is trying to shift our perspective so that we are not living in stress and anxiety around three areas. Money, work, and family. This is what the psalmist is trying to help reorient our perspective so that we are not living anxious and stressed and worried in these three years. Do these three areas matter to our lives? Yep. What do we stress about? We stress about money, we stress about work problems, and we stress about our kids and family. And the psalmist is trying to give us a guide and some practices to not walk in this sense of stress and anxiety, but teach us properly how to shift our perspective and model a life of faith instead. Can we get into this for just a few minutes together? Number one, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. The psalmist encourages us to surrender to God. Surrender to God. Look at the first first verse. It says, unless the Lord builds the house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with centuries will do no good. What's it talking about? It's talking about your possessions, It's talking about your life. It's talking about the the, the financial realities. Man, do we worry about this. Boy, do we get it in our minds that our money is ours to control. In fact, it's gotten to the point for, for many people, especially many believers in America, that the number one priority we have in any one election has to do with economics. 
It's become the thing that has consumed so much of what, and we're willing to lower standards of morality if we're promised better financial outcomes. We'll make concessions for things that we ought not make concessions for just so long as our 401k does all right. Because we're not really surrendering it to God, we're still trying to be sovereign as it relates to our possessions and our wealth. When you live in a place surrendered to God with your finances, when you live in a place where all of the the provision of your life comes from God, your provider, who is your good shepherd, you live open-handed and you live in a way surrendered to God. No one wants to waste their life. We all want to feel a sense of purpose. I've never met anybody who's like, you know what I'd really like? I'd like to take up space in the world to waste people's air and oxygen and to do nothing with my life. I would really like to live a meaningless existence, please. Where is that in the college school track? It's, it's not really how God made us. Nor did he make you to be the chief aim and operator setting your own priorities in your life. And many of us find ourselves weighted down with stress and anxiety because we're trying to live this rat race of providing and getting more and doing everything we can to to preserve and to create a comfortable life. And when that becomes our chief aim, the Lord is not the priority of our life. A life built trying to prove something but is absent of the Lord's priorities is a life that is wasted, it says. You could try to protect it all you want. Guard it. Think about it. You you can earn it. You can build it. You can craft it. You can work as hard as you want to work. But unless the Lord has put his priorities in your heart, you're living according to your sovereignty, not his. The Lord is not on the hook for you building your plans. You building out your plan for your life. You know what he is on the hook for? His plans and purposes. I think we get this idea of calling all backwards. This week I am. I'm I'm the speaker for this regional camp that we're attending. And so I'll be speaking, I think, seven different times this week, morning and evening. So pray for your pastor. Um, I need it. But one of the things that we're going to talk about in identity is this idea of what do you do with your life? How do you come to a place of discerning and discovering what God's created you for? We're going to come from the scriptures and come in, and I'm going to breathe life and encouragement into them because, because we get so crippled trying to live a life of significance that we miss out on a life of surrender. We want to live a life with social clout but we're, re-pri- we're prioritizing the wrong things. What, what did Jesus say? He said there's a priority to this thing. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all those other things will be added unto you. Can I just ask you a question, family? When you decided to follow Jesus, what did you cut out of your life? Or, Did you begin to follow Jesus and just want to add Jesus into your already crowded priorities of life, living life your way, and asking him to bless it? Because unless the Lord is building the house of your life, your labor is in vain. Can I tell you how Jesus said it? In Matthew 16, he says, What profit does it do a man to gain everything they wanted to accomplish in the world? have all of the accolades, give out all the awards, the top of everything, but yet their soul has been forfeited. What's the, what's the point? When you choose to live a life surrendered to God, you begin to live with his priorities, his perspectives, his ways. And listen, God is not looking for you to perform and achieve something for his sake. He's actually inviting you into a real relationship where he knows your name and you know his name. Where he knows your heart and you know what his heart is. At the end of the day, I think it's good for us to grow in a place to say, at the end of the day, I want to bring honor to God's name, not honor to my own name. And that's how I live surrendered. In fact, if I'm not living with heaven's priorities in my life, whatever I achieve is vain and meaningless, the Bible says. 
You could win all of the athletic awards that you want. It doesn't get you into heaven. You can have all the academic accolades put to your name and get all the scholarships and do all the study and do all the things and have the best job. But at the end of the day, if you aren't bringing honor to his name according to his ways and his priorities and his purposes, the things of your life will sour. And he's asking you instead to surrender to God. Men, can I encourage you to be a man and a father surrendered to God. Model to your kids what it looks like to surrender all of your life, all of your achievements, all of your pursuits to the priority of God. In other words, make it your aim to not make any one decision about any one priority without talking to God first. And then model for your kids and your wife how they can do that too. This is the the psalm. Don't don't build your house in vain. Instead, surrender it to God. Have that relationship with him. Number two, it's this. Stop and rest. This is the second encouragement. If we're going to lower stress and anxiety and the weight of the life that we're carrying, number one, we have to surrender to God. Number two, we need to stop and rest. Somebody say stop and rest. Listen to what it says in verse two. It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat. For God gives rest. God wants to give you rest to his beloved. Can I I ask you a question? How are you sleeping at night? Stressed, things running through your head, trying to figure stuff out. You're just feeling the weight of life. That's not what God has for you. It's not that God's, not God's design. That's not his invitation. His invitation is to give his loved ones sleep and rest. Biblically speaking, the opposite of rest is not work. Biblically speaking, the opposite of rest is restlessness. Restlessness. That's the opposite of rest. Why why do I say that? Because the God has given us a gift of rest. In fact, he 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 baked it and integrated it into the very rhythm of life. Every day your day begins from a place of rest. You would call it sleep. The turning of a day begins with rest. God created this cycle from the very beginning. 6 days you work and the 7th you should stop working and rest. Yeah, pastor, but we're not under the law. We don't have to keep the Sabbath. That's not what God says. Well, how's that working for you? How's it working for you? The principle of the Sabbath is a gift that God wants to give you to be enjoyed in your life, and it requires you to intentionally stop and rest. Sabbath doesn't mean being idle and having no activity in your life. Sabbath is finding delight and pleasure in the, ta- in the activity you choose to do, not the activity that you have to do. Some of you, this is a new concept. Some of you, you've seen it before. Can I just say it this way? That one week of vacation isn't going to remedy the damage that you have done to your soul of 51 weeks of restless living and lack of Sabbath rhythm. That's why when you go on vacation, you come back needing another Because you're doing it according to the priorities that culture has set, not to the rhythm which God has ordained and blessed. Because God says, this is the Sabbath day, and he made it holy, and he blessed it. So whether it's a full 24-hour period or a window of time that you take where you stop and rest, what do you do with Sabbath? Well, I think Sabbath involves your spirit, your soul, and your body. Experiencing renewal and enjoyment in those areas. When we Sabbath, I I encourage our staff, I encourage what we do in our, 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 personally, my wife and I, we we stop work, we enjoy rest, which means sometimes I just take a nap, like sleep a little longer. Whenever I'm doing this to stop and rest, I'm I'm going to stop working, I'm going to enjoy rest, I'm going to practice delight in life, and I'm going to commune with God. This is what I'm going to do. 
John Tyson, in his book, Beautiful Resistance, talks about how rest must, re- must re- resist anxiousness. And he writes on this idea of having and increasing this stopping and resting in our lives. He says this, Our lack of rest carries serious health consequences. Research shows that failing to rest after six days of steady work will lead to insomnia or sleeplessness, hormonal imbalances, fatigue, irritability, organ stress, and other increasingly serious physical and mental symptoms. But it is not just the physical or mental labor itself. Even turning our attention to matters of work when we are resting has been shown to trigger stress-induced anxiety. Thinking about work can be a form of work. This cycle of exhaustion must be addressed and broken through deep rest. Here, here's, here's the clincher. Weariness or restlessness rarely leads to godliness. You make dumb decisions when you're tired and worn out. When stress is high. You say things that you don't really, really want to say when you're living in that restless place. This is why so many men make decisions morally that they deeply regret. Because it's in moments when you are restless and anxious and stressed, you think the grass is greener on the other side. But it's not. The grass is greener where you've watered it. Or over the septic tank, your choice. <laughs> why, 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 why am I saying all this? Be- because I don't want you to live restless. F- Philippians 4 goes on to say it like this. Paul says, let your graciousness be known to everyone. Are you known for your irritability or your restfulness and graciousness? Children, don't answer that question for your parents out loud right now. Just like eyes on me, young people. It'll be all right, I promise. Right? Like, you go ask mom. No, you go ask mom. You go, no, I ain't asking her. Right? Like, when we're living, Max, listen to what he says, though. Let your graces be known to everyone. Why? The Lord is near. What do we do when we stop and rest and practice Sabbath? You know what we do? We stop and we commune with the Lord, asking the Lord to come near. We stop living at a blitz pace in our life, and we cut away non-essentials to the point where we are sitting back saying, God, I'm here to meet with you. The Lord is near. Now, Now look what it says. So then don't worry about anything. Most of us are worrying about everything. I wonder if it's because we haven't stopped and rest and allowed the Lord to come near. Still living in our own strength. He says, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. This is how you commune and talk to God. This is prayer. And let the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Parents, be parents who learn how to rest as a family, not take vacations. I don't have a problem with vacations. That's great. It's probably making you go more broke than you need to go. I don't have a problem. Vacations are fantastic. But it's not going to replace a rhythm of stopping and resting in a consistent way to which God has designed your life to live with. Stop being anxious about everything, but instead bring it to God in prayer and petitions. Friends, let's be people. Let's be men. Let's be women. Let's be people of God who rest, not live restless lives. Here's why. Because when you stop and rest, you can live with gratitude for what you have rather than resenting what God has already given you. And most of us live in a pace of trying to accomplish more, get more, and compare our lives because we have not stopped with a rhythm of being grateful for what God has given us. And so we're creating this desire to get more, which is feeding the restlessness of our soul. The relationships that we want that we don't have, rather than being grateful for the ones that God has already brought into our lives. 
We start thinking about the, 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 the home life that could be ours, that other people have, that we don't have, and we live with comparison rather than contentment. And we find ourselves being restless, 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 restless. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. When we, leave, when we live restless, you will eventually begin to resent the gifts that God has already given to you. Which leads me to the third thing that the psalmist tells us. He tells us to steward your life and gifts. Your life is a gift. The things of your life are a gift from God. Steward them well. What is, what is it that God has given you? Well, Psalms 127, verse 3 says, Children are a gift from the Lord. Children are a gift from the Lord. You, you want to know what you start to resent when you don't stop and rest? The gift of your family. That's the first one. Children are a gift from the Lord. God has given you lots of gifts. The question is, how are you stewarding them? How are you living in a way that honors God with the things that he's put in your hands? Your possessions, your abilities, your skills, your financial realities, your your character, your charisma, your personality? Are you stewarding your life and gifts in a way? I love what it says. It's a really interesting picture. I've just been, just continue to meditate on this this week. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. I've said it before, but the reward for good stewardship here, me friends, is more to steward. And children are one of those gifts. Uh, there's, there's this thought process that uh, there, there are two opposing thoughts that neither of them are biblical when it comes to children and family. And, and you'll hear them in culture all around. Number one, children are something that people resent and don't want to have anymore. You see the re resentment. Why? Because of restlessness and we're not actually surrendered to the Lord. We're actually living in our own lives as our own gods, thinking and choosing our bodies and our sexuality as our own God as opposed to God himself who made and gave those things as gifts to, to be enjoyed. <clears throat> no, number two, go back and watch the podcast, friends. <laughs> number two, you know, you know what happens? We begin to feel entitled to the gifts that are given as a reward and a blessing. Children are a gift. They aren't your right. They're not a promise. They're a privilege. They are a gift that we steward. Men, they are a gift that we shepherd and steward in the ways of God. They are a gift from the Lord. Children born to a young man, that's all of us, we just all claim that one, are like arrows in a hand of a warrior. Arrows in a warrior's hand. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full. My dad had six kids. This was one of his favorite verses. <laughs> I'm a blessed, my quiver's full, I'm blessed. Well, crazy times in my life, praise the Lord. My quiver's full with three. Thank you, Lord. Like, I got all I can handle with, like, I am half the man, I guess my dad was. My quiver be full. They're in the hands of a warrior. They're in the hands of a warrior. Arrows in ancient Near East were, were these pieces from a tree and wood that, that had to be straightened because they were born with, they were, they were created with a bent. Your children were born with a bent towards evilness, rebellion, and wickedness. They have a bent towards sin. And in your hands, moms and dads, we are to reorient and straighten them to point in the right direction towards God. That's job number one. Number two that you would have to do with the arrow was sharpen it. Sharpen it. Not entertain it. Not give in to all of its needs, desires, and whims. Not let them play every sport under heaven. But to sharpen their eyes, their ears, and their hearts towards God. Your kid won't go to heaven if they're the MVP of the baseball team. They will go to heaven if their heart has learned to be loyal and allegiant to Jesus. I'm not saying those other things are wrong, but if our pri pri prior 
priorities. Are you congratulating and <clears throat> are you loving your kids because they're growing in their ways of God or are you loving their kids because they've achieved something that made you feel good as a parent? We straighten, we sharpen, we pull them back. They want to go do their own thing and live their own life. No, no, no. We put boundaries in place so they don't get unlimited screen time. They don't get unlimited social media use. They don't get to say and dress and do and whatever. No, no, no. We're pulling them back to live according to the boundaries and the precepts of the ways of God so that when the time is right, we release them to fly to the destiny that God's called them to. You are training and stewarding and shaping and coaching and molding your children to live the life that God has called them to, not the one that makes you proud. And when they walk in accordance to the ways of God and the word of God and the will of God, you're going to find joy and delight in that for sure. But, but their hand, they're, they're like arrows in the hand of a young warrior. I wonder if, if, if we've spent so much time trying to fight culture, we forgot the greatest weapon God gave us, which is training our children to expand and take back culture in their generation. I, I wonder if, We've spent so much time building homes and working with anxiety and trying to provide what our children never had that instead of them growing in gratitude, they've just grown in entitlement to some things. I wonder if it's because we've, we forgot that the greatest tool that we have to bring the kingdom of God into the world today is living in our roofs that we train and we shape and we point them towards the kingdom of God. Men, let's be aware that God has given us gifts to steward. He's given us a life and a gift that we steward back to him. Matthew chapter 5, words of Jesus. I want to read this to you, the message paraphrase. In fact, part of this verse is stuck on, on, on your, your Father's Day gifts because I, I want you to recognize something, that your life is a gift. Your life is a, is a whole makeup of stuff to steward rather than stress out about. Matthew 5, verse 13 through 16, in the message paraphrase, it says this. Let me tell you why you are here. You're here to bring the salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors in this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? If you've lost your usefulness, you will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. No, we're going public with this, as, as public as a city on a hill. If, if, I make the light, if I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a basket, do you? No, I'm, I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to be open with God. This generous Father in heaven. Your life is a gift full of things to steward. So let's steward our life and our gifts in a way that brings out the godliness, the character, the image of God that he's given into our children, that he's put on the people and around us, that, that we all as image bearers bear and mark the fingerprint of God, but, but it takes those who are full of the light of God to help them reflect and recognize that they have the light of God already shining in them, wanting to illuminate their way back to God. God set eternity in the hearts of every human being. It's us to, up to us to be people on a hill living out this way to shine and help point them back towards God. When it comes to being a godly man and a godly parent, I have to admit, I can often feel like I don't measure up and I can often feel like I'm just hiding some of the light. But we don't have to live in the shadow of shame. We can find life in our surrender to God. We don't have to try to pursue these fake points of glory, possessions, success at work, our 
kids having great achievements, but no character. We don't have to pursue these false sense of glory. No, we can experience the full glory of God, the light of God, because we've surrendered our life to him and said yes to the invitation to come close to him. If you're here and you're a father, would you stand to your feet? We want to pray over you. All the, all the fathers in the room, would you stand? Now, for those of you who aren't standing, would you now stand and surround the men that are already standing? And would you just place a hand on their shoulder? You might know them, you might not know them. But we can stand with them. And I want to pray a blessing over the fathers today. I'll lead out, but you pray words that come to your heart and mind. Are we ready? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for these men who are standing. Men who are called to model and show the way of the life of faith. And so, God, I'm asking that they would live a life surrendered to you. I'm asking, God, that you would help them to, 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 to live a life that stops and rests in you. And I'm asking you, God, to help them live a life that stewards the very gifts that you've given to them, their abilities, their children, their, their livelihood, their work ethic, their environment. Lord, would you help them steward those things in a way that brings honor to your name, that helps shape a culture and a future towards God. Lord, we speak blessing over these men. Would you surround them? Would you undergird them? Would you strengthen them? Would you lift their heads if they feel weary and worn down? When they feel like life is too heavy of a burden, would you help them remember Remember that they can cast their cares and burdens and you're there walking with them. Would you show them that they're loved and celebrated today? We speak this in the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Hey, we're gonna speak blessing over one another and end with our benediction. Just as a remember, a reminder, make sure you grab a gift. This is for all the dudes in the room, dads or not, all the dudes, we've got a gift for you. And there's lots of goodies for us to all enjoy in between our services as well. Let's speak this blessing over one another, nice and strong. It's up on the screen, ready, let's read it. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. And hey, we love you. Happy Father's Day. You're dismissed. I really hope today's message was life-giving. As a church, we want to help you encounter God and take another next step in your allegiance to Jesus. I want to ask you to take a step right now, in fact. Would you just share this message with a friend? Maybe post it on your social, text a coworker the link. Just be sure to include something that you learned or how it impacted you personally. When you do that, you get to be a part of seeing faith come to life in someone else. And don't forget to visit our central hub, faithchurchks.org. You'll find other next steps that you can take in your faith, including giving and partnership with us as we help others encounter Jesus like you've encountered him. Hey, we love you. And until we get to hang out again, remember, don't shrink back from your faithful allegiance to King Jesus.